This episode is being sponsored by our friends over at the Deadbolt Mystery Society. We have an awesome monthly subscription box service that if you guys are fans of true crime and unsolved mysteries, you really need to check out. Each box contains its own mystery where you do things like hunt down a killer, solve a kidnapping, or stop a madman before it's too late. Recently, I've been solving the Pretender box, which sends you to a horror author's house that sits on an isolated lake. It gets pretty intense and you receive a ton of evidence, and the coolest part is there are also QR codes throughout the contents that show you videos, photos, and other evidence, so you get truly immersed in this box trying to figure out who the Pretender is before they strike again. Crate Joy has over 260 reviews by people just like you that have joined the Deadbolt Mystery Society, and they average 4.9 out of 5 stars, which Deadbolt totally deserves. Go to DeadboltMysterySociety.com today and use the code DEADBOLT20 to get 20% off any subscription or single box right now. Again, that's 20% off when you use the promo code DEADBOLT20. Come join the Deadbolt Mystery Society today. Five Creepy Mysteries from California California, home to Hollywood and the iconic American life. But, just like everywhere else, California has its fair share of unusual mysteries. The cases on this list feature just that. These are five creepy mysteries from California. Number five, Anna Waters. Anna Waters lived with her family on the coastal part of San Mateo County in California. On January 16th of 1973, five-year-old Anna arrived home from school at 1 p.m. She changed clothes and headed to the yard to play while her mother and stepfather stayed inside the house. At 2 p.m., her mother heard Anna talking and thought she was speaking to the cats. Several minutes later, around 2.20 p.m., her mother realized she couldn't hear her anymore and decided to check. After a search of the immediate area, they couldn't find her and quickly called police. By 3.15, police were at the scene. Authorities and the family concentrated efforts in searching the creek for fear she had been swept off. However, a foot-by-foot search of the area turned up nothing. They said if Anna had disappeared in the creek, Her body would have washed up on the banks or been trapped under the several dams or underbrush between the property and the ocean. When the creek search became a dead end, police considered the other possibility, that Anna was abducted. Initially, authorities thought a stranger had abducted her. A neighbor said five minutes before Anna was proclaimed missing, he saw a white van with a young man and old man inside of it. They weren't residents of the area. The place where Anna's family lived was not a major road and the only time someone would go there is if they were visiting someone or lived there themselves. This made it unlikely a predator would deliberately drive to the desolate road to find Anna unless she was being targeted. In comes the speculation that Anna's father, George, was involved. George developed an unusual relationship with a man named George Brody around the time of Anna's birth. Brody immediately began to manipulate Waters and his family, causing a strain in the marriage which ended in a divorce. Waters went on to live with Brody in a twisted guru-disciple setting, and there were questions of whether the relationship was sexual as well. Brody from the start had a disturbing interest in Anna. He believed that she was the reincarnation of a woman he lived with before. Brody insisted the name Ify be added to Anna's name, just so numerologically, it would add up to the same number of letters as in his name. Anna's dad's behavior became more erratic the more he lived with Brody, and later he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, but his family didn't want him hospitalized because it would revoke his doctor's license. George's devotion to Brody and the sighting of an old man and young man within the vicinity of Anna's home during her disappearance causes people to believe they might have been involved. Even more suspicious, George didn't even bother contacting his wife after Anna disappeared. He merely called his lawyer and asked for child support payments to be stopped now that she was gone. However, despite the speculation, 
There is no proof the two Georges were involved. Brody died from throat cancer in December of 1981, and shortly after, George killed himself by drinking poison in January of 1982. No one knows for sure whether they took Anna or what they did with her, if anything. And so Anna Waters remains missing to this day. Number 4. The Salamones On the night of October 12, 1982, an entire family of four disappeared from their home on Lassen Street in Northridge, California, and no one has seen them since. The family of four were Sol Solomon, Elaine, and their two children, 15-year-old Michelle, Elaine's daughter from a previous marriage, and 9-year-old Mitchell, Sol and Elaine's child. According to records, Sol ran a fire extinguisher refilling and repair business and owned several rental properties in the area. He also had an interest in buying and repairing vintage and exotic cars. On the night of October 12th, neighbors didn't notice anything unusual at the Salomon home. But two days later, a friend called police saying they haven't seen the family and that their swimming pool was overflowing into another neighbor's yard. Other family members as well as employees also called police reporting the missing. Authorities arrived at the home but found it locked. When they forced themselves in, they couldn't find any of the family members except for their dog. Everything seemed in place and all the valuables were there including $2,500 in cash. There was also a Rolls Royce left behind in the garage. Police searched the home and everything seemed fine until they got inside 15-year-old Michelle's room. They first found some small blood splatter and later discovered bloodied bed sheets. However, police never found any signs of a violent struggle anywhere else in the home. And what's more, they were unsure why the family would be targeted. Days after the disappearance, Sol and Elaine's wallets were found on a stretch of highway miles from their house. Rumors about Sol's associations then began. There were talks that he was involved with the Israeli Mafia, which operated around the Los Angeles area. Family members disputed the allegations and offered a $50,000 reward for their return. But later on, police said they were familiar with Saul Solomon, but never elaborated as to what capacity. Police also publicly questioned how Saul was able to afford certain items based on his income, property, and business. Later, police received a lead that Saul had a falling out with a business associate on the afternoon of October 12, 1982. That associate was a British man named Harvey Rader. Rader lived in L.A. and owned a specialty vintage car and restoration business, and it was through this that he met Sol. It said Sol had invested or loaned $20,000 to Rader and his shop, but he wasn't happy with how it was going. They then had an argument later that afternoon. Authorities questioned Rader, but he denied anything to do with the family's disappearance. A full investigation was done with Rader as a potential suspect after a former colleague of his claimed he had something to do with the Solomons being missing. More suspicion then fell on Rader after he was tied to other mysterious disappearances. While he was the most likely suspect, there was no concrete evidence linking him to the Solomons' disappearance. Nevertheless, though, prosecutors filed charges against him for the murders, despite no bodies and on slim evidence. This resulted in two mistrials. A third resulted in Raider's acquittal. Shortly after, Raider left the country. As for the Solomons, they remain missing to this day. Number 3. Kevin Collins It's been 36 years since 10-year-old Kevin Collins mysteriously vanished in San Francisco, California. Born to David and Ann Collins, Kevin was one of nine kids. At the time, he was a fourth grader at St. Agnes School in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco. On February 10th of 1984, Kevin left early for basketball practice at their school gymnasium. His older brother Gary usually accompanied him to basketball practice, but he was sick that day and had to stay home. After practice was over, Kevin walked out of the school and was seen waiting at the corner of Oak Street and Masonic Avenue at around 7.55 p.m. 
He was waiting for the number 43 bus. Witnesses who saw him said he was speaking to a tall, blonde-haired man. Kevin never got home that day and has never been seen since. At the time, there was no Amber Alert established just yet, so TV shows, local news, and print advertisements were the only way for information to be disseminated. Shortly after he disappeared, posters with pictures of him were displayed and distributed all throughout San Francisco. Almost the entire country was on the lookout for the boy, having his face printed on milk cartons, billboards, and national magazine covers. Kevin was, in fact, one of the first children whose face appeared on milk cartons in the country. Despite the search efforts, there were hardly any leads as to Kevin's whereabouts. There was brief hope on the case in January of 2013 when a search warrant was issued to a home on Masonic Avenue. The current homeowners weren't a suspect, but a previous owner, convicted pedophile Wayne Jackson, was. Jackson had died of natural causes in 2008, but he once lived just right across the street from Kevin's school. One of the witnesses that day said Kevin was speaking to a blonde man with a large dog and at the time, Jackson also had a large dog. Initially, when police searched the home, two police cadaver dogs signaled that they detected remains under concrete. However, after the area was excavated, authorities found bones which they believed are animal bones and not human. For the family, the uncovering of a possible suspect was frustrating. They believed Jackson should have been investigated before since he already had a history of pedophile behavior and arrest. Kevin's case remains unsolved to this day. Number 2. Mount Shasta Located along the Cascade Range of Northern California, Mount Shasta is a stunning double peak extinct volcano that has become a favorite hiking spot for many. Aside from its natural beauty, Mount Shasta is considered a sacred place by many different Indian tribes in the area. Many of these tribes have used particular areas of Mount Shasta to train their medicine men and women in spiritual vision quests and healing. Not only that, the mountain is also steeped in lore, with many legends saying the mountain comes with significant earth energy. One of the oldest legends about the mountain is that it's home to a mysterious dwarf-like tribe who live near the center of the peak. And many hunters and campers seem to corroborate this, reporting that they've seen small beings running through the woods. It's not just small beings being sighted on this unusual mountain, but even the infamous Bigfoot is said to inhabit the forests of the area. One famous account was by Virgil Larson in 1976. Originally from Idaho, Larson was on Mount Shasta for a logging operation. At 8.30 a.m., him and his friend, Pat Conway, were heading to the log landing where they worked. The hike wasn't easy, and as they went on, the men became separated by thick trees but were close enough to still hear each other. They decided to take a break, and it was at this time Larson heard what he thought was another person coming down the slope. Thinking it was a forest service man, he called out to the individual, but nothing came back. Larson could still hear the man walking behind the bush and turning towards them. The logger called out again, and to his shock, a creature lifted its head above the bushes. He described this animal as a tall, ghastly, dark-haired beast, something beyond human. He also said it smelled terrible, even though it was 20 yards away from him. Larson ran for his life, and when he returned later with Pat Conway, the creature was gone, but the smell remained. A forest ranger later inspected the area and found nothing but undefined footprints and a vague smell. And still, that's not the only mystery around the mountain. Mount Shasta has also become host to a number of strange disappearances, the most famous of which is of Carl Landers. The 69-year-old was climbing the mountain with two friends, Milton Gaines and Barry Gilmore, on May 25, 1999. Landers was described as an experienced climber who ran every morning for 30 years to keep in shape. His goal was to climb Mount Shasta and reach its peak. Back in 1998, he tried but failed to reach the summit, hence he wanted to try it again. 
The trio used the Bunny Flat Trailhead with a distance of six miles towards the summit. On May 22nd, they stayed at a motel and left at 4 a.m. in the morning to start their hike. The next night, they stayed at an area of the mountain called 5050 Plateau, an area covered with boulders. They wanted to rest properly before making the last push for the summit. The next day, Carl pushed ahead 30 minutes early from his friends, but when they finally caught up with him, they could find no sign of Carl. Search and rescue efforts were relentless, sending men to almost every area of the mountain to find signs of Carl Landers, but there was nothing. Experts believe Carl disappeared between the 50-50 plateau and Lake Helen. What's baffling is that the area above the tree line wasn't steep or had any crevices. There were no off-trail tracks found, and it was only a distance of 650 feet a relatively flat area with no tree cover or brush. Cadaver dogs and human scent dogs also couldn't find his scent during the search. Carl's disappearance would be just one of the many mysterious disappearances as well as mysteries reported on that mountain. Number 1. Disappearance of Christine Waters In 2008, Christine Waters from Deerfield, Wisconsin, took a vacation to Portland, Oregon for the summer. She was a student at the University of Wisconsin studying botany. Although scheduled to return to the university by fall, she liked Portland and decided to stay a bit longer. Afterward, she decided to visit friends in Eureka, California. Christine at the time was deeply interested in spirituality as well as alternative lifestyles. She was also devoted to various environmental causes. During her travels, she kept close contact with her family, but this changed once she got to California. The calls became less frequent, and she began asking for money from her parents. Then on November 12th, Christine was discovered standing naked on the doorstep of a rural home just outside Arcata, close to Eureka. She looked confused and was covered in briar scratches all over. Police were called and she was taken to a hospital for treatment. She looked frightened and said someone was after her and they were going to find her. However, she didn't say exactly what happened. Her drug tests were negative so police didn't detain her. She was taken to a local motel where she got in touch with her parents. She had lost her identification and needed money to get home so her father wired her $1,000 while her mom faxed her documents to serve as her identification in the meantime. On November 14th, she went to a copy center to pick up her fax documents. While there, employees noted she looked nervous and paranoid, even hiding the papers. After this, no one knew where she went. When she didn't contact her family again, she was reported missing on November 17th. The money her father wired sat untouched in her account. Her belongings, including identification and money, were found at a spiritual center in Arcata later on. According to the people there, Christine usually left her items there whenever she went for walks in the Arcata community forest. Hoping to find answers, her family hired a private investigator and they discovered Christine had joined a tea ceremony days before she went missing. These tea ceremonies are illegal since participants are given a drink which is laced with DMT, a controlled substance. Drinking this tea results in hallucinations, vomiting, and diarrhea, which can last up to 10 hours. And some of these reactions are more violent on individuals with a predisposition for mental illness. Despite this, it's unclear whether her participation in the ceremony is linked to her disappearance. To this day, she's still considered missing, and her case remains unsolved. So there were five creepy mysteries from California. California is the third largest state in the U.S., so it's no surprise these creepy stories, and many more like them, lurk in this beautiful yet heavily populated area of the United States. If you like this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday for you to check out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.